afternoon, everyone, and thank you for participating in the extended day ahead market working group one meeting. This meeting is focused on supply commitment and resource efficiency evaluation. Uh, this is Christina Osborne from the ISS stakeholder engagement group. I'll be providing support for the meeting. Mark Richardson will be the facilitator and Bob Cott will capture the key takeaways and um, we also may be joined by Phil Pettengill, who is the coordinator of all the EDM working groups. Uh, these meetings are held weekly on Mondays and Wednesdays from 1 to 3, um, and all of the participation details, so the WebEx information is available on ISO's public calendar. So for today's agenda, we do have Jeff Spires from PowerX, who will be presenting a proposal for the EDM resource efficiency design on behalf of the AIM entities. And then after Jeff's presentation, Mark Richardson We'll lead a discussion on the scope items as they relate to the RSC. And then at the end of the presentation, Bob is going to provide a recap of the discussion. And then Mark will talk about uh, the topics for the next meeting. Uh, so if at any time you do have a question, um, please feel free to raise your hand. You can select the hand icon above the chat window, or if you dialed into the meeting, press pound two on your telephone keypad. Uh, and just a reminder to please state your name and affiliation first so that others know who's speaking. Uh, the working group meetings are recorded and the video files are posted on the working group webpage, along with the other materials related to this working group. And then please, we do ask that you uh, request permission from the ISO before reprinting any related uh, meeting transcriptions. If you're interested in presenting at an upcoming working group meeting, um, please reach out to the ISO using the inquiry link located on the resources slide at the end of the presentation. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the meeting over to Mark Richardson. Thank you, Christina. Can you confirm you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I look forward to continuing our discussion on the various topics today around the resource counting and qualification guidelines to consider when determining whether or not an EDAM entity is passing the resource efficiency evaluation. Prior to getting into those slides, I wanted to also note that we heard from several entities the need for there to be a proposal on the different topics first, then as a group, use that proposal as a starting point for discussion. So today, I would like to start with a presentation from Jeff Spires at PowerX. I appreciate Jeff volunteering to present on behalf of the joint EIM entities, a presentation that was provided back in February 2020, I believe. This presentation walks through the RSC design and concept considerations. I wanted to give a heads up to the audience that I will be pausing Jeff throughout the presentation to see where the various parties, Northwest, Southwest, and California entities land on the different topics. The goal is to find a common ground or understand the two different options for a given topic so that the ISO policy team can take those items into consideration and move those along in the straw proposal. So with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Jeff so, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand so we can unmute your line, and then I'll turn the floor over to you, sir. Great. Thanks, Mark. Can you hear me okay? I hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Jeff Spires with PowerX, and uh, thanks uh, to Mark and the KAISO staff for the opportunity to present today. Uh, I, I did think, you know, just to maybe clarify uh, somewhat where we are here, and you can kind of see by this title slide, uh, these were put together and presented by the EIM entities as a group um, basically two years ago in Folsom. And I think in some of the prior discussions we've had in these workshops, um, the, the concept of sort of starting of, of from a, a framework or some thinking about what, how the pieces fit together might be useful. And that was why I suggested we go back to these materials. And I think there's quite a bit of content here that could be helpful. But, you know, that said, it was two years ago. Um, I think that these materials at the time reflected the EIM entities' collective thoughts. But, um, you know, of course, it's, it's older. And uh, so I would encourage the other EIM entities that are on the call, if they want to chime in and contribute, please do. Um, because, you know, I'm going to walk through this relatively quickly and I'll be naturally providing a, a PowerX perspective on some of these topics. So I just want to make sure that it's clear that, you know, we're, we're just trying to um, facilitate the discussion by going back over the work that we had done in the past. Uh, so if we can move forward, please. Uh, again, this is sort of the same kind of caveat, just recognizing that the EIM entities that did work on this 
at the time represent a diverse group and are differently situated. Um, and so, you know, there could be specific areas or viewpoints that differ from uh, the consensus, but we're really trying to figure out what are some of the consensus views at the time. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, this was a fairly lengthy presentation. You can see there were a number of different categories. Um, I think maybe what would make sense to me, Mark, is I think there's about five slides or so that focus on some of the higher level objectives and principles, and I think uh, I could walk through those and then maybe that's a good place to stop uh, for questions and discussion. Uh, Absolutely. Next. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Uh, one more, please. Okay. Um, so, you know, first of all, just kind of taking a step back and recognizing that a regional day ahead market, an organized market, if it's designed properly, can re represent a significant opportunity. And if EDAM is designed well and moves forward, it can provide significant benefits. And there's under, you know, a number of different categories that are listed there. You know, hourly day ahead transactions that uh, are, are more efficient than 16 hour blocks. Integrating renewables. One of the key benefits of a day ahead market as opposed to say EIM is centralized unit commitment on a day ahead basis. Also strengthening and supporting reliability. And, you know, an important element is reducing costs through sharing in diversity benefits and doing that in an equitable way and in a defined way. So these are all just a number of the benefits that can stem from a day ahead market design that's structured properly. And, and really the, the, the critical point here in the context of resource efficiency is to recognize that resource efficiency is a foundational element of a workable design for EDAM. We, and why is that? We, we don't have a single RA program across the West. And we're talking about a regional day ahead market in which the volume of transactions will be much larger than the EIM. And if EDAM is successful and, and becomes widely adopted, then it will be determining a significant amount of the unit commitment across BAs in the West. And that centralized unit commitment and that centralized dispatch naturally increases the coordination and the reliance between the BAs and the footprint. And so, you know, it's really important. It's, it's much more important than the EIM when you shift into the day ahead context to, to start with uh, the concept and agreement that resource efficiency is necessary to facilitate the market. And so I think it, the, the fundamental message here is that all entities must be able to pass an accurate and meaningful day ahead resource efficiency test that's fairly applied to all the BAs that are participating. Next slide, please. This slide was really trying to add some more uh, provide, you know, elaborate someone on why, why do we care about resource efficiency and what are the benefits and why do we need it? And, you know, again, we don't have a single RA program. And so to enable EDAM, there needs to be a mechanism to allow each BA to use its independent forward planning approaches, but at the same time validating that each entity is taking the appropriate steps in advance of the market. And there's a number of different objectives that we're trying to meet with resource efficiency. Number one, reliability. If you have a well-designed resource efficiency test, that is one of the key mechanisms to ensure that each BA, through its forward procurement, is providing sufficient capacity, flexibility, et cetera, to be able to meet load. And furthermore, that's one of the key elements that provides that confidence in the EDAM transfers. We've talked about this in the context of transmission as well, but we really want to make sure that under this type of design, if there are transfers between BAs and those transfers are being used to displace 
unit commitments in other BAs that those can be relied upon to meet load. And that's a critical benefit that resource efficiency plays. And, you know, just in general, providing confidence in the market solution. Um, it really also pro uh, promotes participation in the market and ensuring that the, the right amount of uh, characteristics are brought to the market to uh, allow for an effective and efficient market solution. So, you know, defining the amount of capacity and flexibility that needs to be brought ensures that you're getting a, a good dispatch and you have the appropriate quantity of those characteristics available to solve the market efficiently. Uh, but another, you know, really important benefit is it provides a paradigm for accessing and benefiting from diversity because the resource efficiency metric can be lowered, the requirement can be lowered by a calculated amount that recognizes the diversity benefits between BAs that are participating. And so that's one of the advantages of resource efficiency is providing the framework to do that through a lower requirement in advance. The other really important element is ensuring fairness. And this is largely an economic issue, which is protecting against leaning. It also ensures equity and fairness by defining an agreed upon level that all the entities are being held to. And so you don't have some BAs being held to a higher or lower standard than they need to be, and you have equity in terms of the level that all of the BAs are, are, are uh, meeting, which is what allows for you know, uh, the fairness component to be achieved through that consistent application to all the BAs. Um, I think, you know, just listening to some of the discussions in the previous workshops, there's a question that's been raised a couple of times about what is leaning. And um, I, I think it was Alan Mack, uh, perhaps last week, that did a good job of outlining what that issue is. But, you know, just to, to dis discuss, discuss that somewhat here, you know, I would generally define leaning as occurring when an entity is showing up to the, to the market without having procured enough of their own capacity and flexibility. And so they're therefore relying on the capacity and flexibility of the other market participants to fill that gap. So, you know, conceptually, I think it's a pretty simple concept, but it's really important to recognize in this discussion that the economic consequences of that can be really significant. And I think, you know, we all generally know that solving a capacity shortfall is generally a longer term challenge. Perhaps you're building new resources or you're contracting on a longer term basis, on an annual basis or on a seasonal basis. And so absent having an effective resource efficiency framework, the opportunity to not take those steps and instead lean on the market to solve your capacity shortfall can represent a significant cost savings. Because if you're avoiding building a new resource or you're avoiding contracting for a year or for a season, and instead you show up to the market short on the critical days and you just pay the marginal energy price on a handful of hours or on a handful of days when your load is high, that is a significant savings that is at the expense of the entities that did take the appropriate steps ahead of the market to contract and ensure that they show up resource sufficient. So the economic consequences of leaning are, are, are significant and that's one of the key issues here. And so, you know, the bottom line is that reaching an EDAM design that's equitable and attracts maximum participation has to start with agreement that everyone is going to be resource sufficient and meet that test. Because we just won't be successful if we are, are starting from a place where some entities, you know, the, the ratepayers and some BAs are bearing the cost of building resources or securing forward capacity, and meanwhile others aren't. That's just not a, a, an acceptable place to start. And so we need an RS test that's accurate. We need to have consequences that provide the right incentives for each BA to procure on a forward basis, and, and we need a well-defined resource efficiency standard to achieve that. 
and all of these things, these, these concepts are complementary to the forward planning approaches that different BAs have. So recognizing that California has its RA program, other BAs have their forward planning through their RA, IRPs, et cetera, that continues to function, but we have a resource efficiency metric that ensures that those steps and whatever additional steps are needed are taken so that by the time you get to the day ahead market, everyone is resource efficient. Uh, next slide, please. This was just a visualization trying to emphasize that this framework does enable diversity benefits because, you know, absent a centralized approach for committing resources, generally speaking, each BA, BA plans its system on a standalone basis. And each BA, for example, looking at the left side of this chart, each BA is generally deciding its unit commitment on a standalone basis. And so, you know, if each BA is doing that individually, it's pretty likely that that will lead to a less than perfect optimization. And so EDAM provides that framework for pooling the resources. And you can see that the visualization was attempting to show that when you do that, by pooling the resources, you actually reduce the amount of total commitment that is required through diversity. And that savings, that diversity benefit, then becomes a credit that can be allocated back into the BA's resource efficiency requirement to, to lower it, to uh, provide that resource efficiency diversity benefit in advance and allow entities to meet a lower level than they otherwise would if they were planning their system on a standalone basis. Next slide, please. I don't believe we've talked about this much, but this was just trying to set the stage for how do you define the appropriate standard. And when I say standard, I really just mean what is the level of sufficiency that is necessary to achieve these objectives. And so the, the graphic at the top was trying to illustrate some of the trade-offs that would be made between a somewhat lower standard versus a somewhat higher standard. And I think you know, probably the most straightforward way to, to describe it is if you have a very high standard, then, you know, I think quite clearly that can increase the cost for some entities. You know, those, those entities that don't have, uh, already have the resources to meet that level would have to secure additional resources and that could add to costs. Whereas, you know, looking past costs, there's a lot of advantages of the higher standard in terms of you know, you're more confident in the reliability because you have more resources. There's less risk of leaning as there's more supply being put into the market. There's more diversity, uh, et cetera. So really, it, it, I think what this comes down to is a trade-off between costs and these other objectives associated with reliability and ensuring that there's enough supply in the market. And I think, you know, while we haven't uh, defined that clearly, one framework for thinking about this would be, you know, working backwards, which is first, let's consider an acceptable level of reliability for the EDAM footprint as a whole. Because as we've talked about a few times, being confident that the market is reliable is critical to allow entities to really rely on the market solution for unit commitment. And so, you know, gaining the benefits of a day ahead market is, it requires confidence in the solution. So starting there and saying, well, what's an acceptable level of reliability to achieve that seems like a, a, a good place to start. And then working backwards from there to say, you know, how, wh what would that translate into when you apply it to each BA so that when the test is formulated, each BA is providing an appropriate share of the total requirement. Um, and, and again, you know, with the expectation being that the requirements that are ultimately determined should be lower than the standalone calculations because of that diversity benefit. Next slide, please. 
so I think maybe this will be the last slide and then, and then I think stopping for some discussion would be good. So these are some of the principles that the EIM entities has established a couple of years ago with respect to resource efficiency. The first one, RS does not modify local control over RA or replace a BA's obligations. This is a complement to those individual frameworks that already exist. And you know that that that's the first principle, and I think we recognize, but I recognize that. But as I mentioned, we don't have a centralized RA program across the West. So it falls to the day ahead resource sufficiency framework to become the mechanism to verify that each BA through those independent approaches is taking the appropriate steps in advance of the EDAM to meet a common standard. And to achieve that, I wanna emphasize the second bullet. The test has to be accurate and applied consistently to all BAs or all participants. And that starts with an agreed upon standard as we were talking about in the previous slide and then appropriate counting rules for supply to ensure that the supply that's being used is real, that it's capable of performing, and that we avoid issues like double counting between BAs. It's critical to have a consistent framework that is accurate to provide the confidence that each BA is meeting the same standard. That's what establishes a level playing field prior to participating in an EDAM. In addition, you know, I think trying to achieve something that's simple and workable is, is another priority, which includes a couple of uh, important elements. One is, and we've talked about this to some extent in the prior workshops, but timely information and clear clarity about what the requirements are. So defining with enough time that entities understand what they need to do and what steps they need to take to pass. And that also fits in with the second bullet of maintaining or, def or finding a, a methodology to be compatible with the bilateral trading timelines. The next high level objective is preventative enforcement. And this is finding a mechanism to prevent entities that fail from leaning on the EDAM. And I know that will be a significant discussion and the last is full transparency and ongoing review. This is something we've spent a lot of time discussing recently in the context of the EIM. And it's critical that we have transparency, not only to get the design right, but to be able to monitor on an ongoing basis to ensure that the test is functioning correctly. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say that's not on this slide, and then I think stopping for some discussion would be great. These principles are important, but there's, there's another issue, which is we need a commitment to the principle of being resource efficient. It's a foundational element of the design, and we need to agree that every BA, both EIM entities and the CAISO alike, are going to take the steps that they need to take including if that requires additional procurement beyond what their forward planning approaches require, if that's what's necessary to pass. Because the resource efficiency test is really only a verification. It can't fix or address an underlying insufficiency. By the time you get to day ahead or real time, it's really too late to solve the issue and so, you know, we've talked about resource efficiency. Why is it so important? It enables confidence. It's necessary for reliability. It's necessary for uh, economics and to avoid leaning. And so, you know, in PowerX's view, we need to clearly hear a commitment from every entity, both EIM entities and the CAISO, that resource efficiency is a foundational principle and that all entities will take the steps required to pass. In our view, that's what it takes to succeed for EDAM. And you know, I, I understand that the CAISO in particular faces unique challenges um, given the, the different market structure uh, that, Calif the, that the CAISO BA operates under, as well as 
the unique interactions with the RA program. Um, and so, you know, there's a follow-up question there, which is that I think we need to have, which is if the RA program is not enough to pass resource efficiency, what tools and what steps does the CAISO or the LSEs in California have to address that shortfall? Uh, I think that's really important to understand um, because, you know, for us to be successful in designing an EDAM resource efficiency test, we need to start from a place where there's confidence that all entities will pass and we understand how that will occur. So I'll stop there, uh, Mark, and, and turn it over for discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and I appreciate you walking through some of those key principles that, that you just outlined and the way you put it was, was great. Um, I do know we're going to dive into more details around each of these individual key principles here. Um, I do see Stuart Kelly's hand up, so let me go to Stuart Kelly first to see if he wants to comment on your previous slides, and then we'll go from there. Hey, Jeff, th thanks for these initial slides, uh, very well put. I I just a question to yourself, though. When it comes to the definition of leaning, I certainly don't disagree with showing up to the market with enough capacity and flexibility. I, I do worry a little bit, and you may have touched the, uh, upon it in your very first bullet, that, or, or we may need to bring it out more. We, we need a design within the market um, that, that ultimately won't cause leaning. Um, you know, we need to be able to rely on those transfers. Uh, we've got this particular circumstance with load biasing within California, because if we can not only show up to the market, but also rely on the the design within the market, we're going to have this leaning, and the natural effect of that is to increase the standard that's set um, for all parties, particularly if we've got a single test, which you want to benefit. It typically drives up the uncertainty to untenable, untenable levels, and um, you know, in, in my mind, impinges on the. Um, you know, the, the, the reliability component that's left with the BAs, uh, the responsibility is still with the BAs. And, and, it, and then undermines, I think, you know, this, uh, this notion that um, you, you can have a single test. Uh, I, I'm, I'm increasingly, in my own mind, starting to wonder if, because of some of the nuances around the CAISO program, uh, and, unless they are fixed, you can truly, um, you know, apply a single single test unless these design components are fixed. I'd just like to get your, your views on those initial thoughts. Thanks, Stuart. I think those are, are some really important questions that you're raising. I mean, I, I think fundamentally resource efficiency is one element of a successful design. And it's an important one because it's the upfront validation that all the BAs that are entering the market have, have brought that appropriate supply, whether it's capacity, whether it's flexibility, so that we know that where we're starting from is enough supply to cover the majority of potential conditions that we might ultimately see in real time. And so that requires having uh, the right level of inputs in terms of accounting for a load forecast, accounting for an appropriate quantity of uncertainty, setting aside resources for contingency reserves, and all of those elements. But as you're alluding to, resource efficiency is the entry ticket and the, the upfront check and validation. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other areas that also require um, improvements in terms of ensuring that the market solution itself, for example, commits the appropriate quantity of resources and that those resources can be delivered to the right locations such that you can be confident that the solution itself is reliable. Um, so, you know, this is one component that contributes to the reliability question, but it may not be the only one. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but that was my initial reaction to, to the direction you were going. Yeah, and, and I think in this particular one, there is a real nexus to what's happening with the real-time RSE and, and the prioritization of imports. Um, I, I, 
I, I really feel that we, we need some clarity um, so that we get a better solution here for EDAM potentially. Because my, my real concern is, uh, uh, you know, absent that, you end up with a higher standard. That's a real concern to me. And then it also undermines, in my mind, the ability to, to cure. I mean, I understand there should be a market mechanism to cure, but there should be a fair and equitable price. But if um, you have a potentially flawed design, then you, you may not get that kind of fair and balanced outcome. So thank you. Yeah. No, I appreciate your response to that, Jeff and Stuart, for your comments. And you know, for the real-time RFC, I want to table those conversations for a different form. But I want to see if, if Danny Johnson wanted to, you know, from the ISO, wanted to respond to some of Stuart's comments before I move to Steve Kern. Danny, you may have to unmute your line. Or oh, there you go. I hear you. Yeah, um, I was uh, I was double muted. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess responding directly to Stuart, I, I think we would agree that that getting the uncertainty right to give confidence is, is really important. Regarding the real-time RSC, I think the concerns that were identified in that venue somewhat go away here since it's one day ahead schedule. That's more trying to blend a centrally procured market with uh, bilateral markets in a real-time time frame. But I think going a little bit farther back to something I heard Jeff say that I was hoping uh, to get a little expansion on. I, I thought I heard you say that BAAs must commit to take steps beyond uh, the procurement that they're making in their I, RA programs or IRPs to meet the RSC. And I, I guess if I understood that right, I think it's a little concerning because one of the principles we're entering into this in is that the EDAM, including meeting the, R, the EDAM RSC, shouldn't modify the state or local control over long-term RA planning or integrated resource planning. So. It, did I understand that right? Thanks, Danny. I, I, I'm glad that you asked that because you did hear that right. And the way I would characterize it is it's one thing to say that the EDAM test doesn't modify those forward programs, whether it's California's RA program or some other, you know, whether it's an IRP or, or some other approach. But that doesn't mean that those forward frameworks will be enough to pass a well-designed day ahead test. And it's common, I would say there's many BAs or multiple BAs whose forward planning IRPs, for example, don't leave them in a position where they would pass a day ahead test and they will have to go out and forward procure and that's what they do today to pass the real time test. They will supplement those longer term processes with forward contracting to make sure that by the time they get to the, the application of the test, they have secured enough supply to meet resource efficiency. And what I'm saying is that that's exactly the same for California, where this test and the design of the test is a complement to the RA program. But if the RA program is not sufficient, to ensure that the PISO BA has enough supply to meet the test, then there needs to be clarity about what additional steps either the CAISO or LSEs within the CAISO can take to address that gap, because we can't have a situation where CAISO just shows up day ahead without having taken those steps up. I don't think that will be successful. Thanks, Jeff. And I'm I'm not indicating or saying that the CAISO as a BAA would look to be resource insufficient in the day ahead. I just want to make everybody aware that that, that was a principle that passing the RSC shouldn't dictate those IRP and RA programs. And I guess I'm a, a, a little concerned because this is going to eventually get into the preventative enforcement conversation that we don't have consequences that essentially unravel that paradigm and, and force entities by their participation in EDAM to uh, or moves the control out of the, the local regulatory authorities uh, for the forward procurement. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think this is a really important conversation to have, Danny, so I appreciate that you're raising it because it's really getting at the crux of the issue, which is we know the challenges with the RA program, and we don't see the path from an RA program that doesn't leave CAISO in the position to pass a test, how do we get from that state to a day ahead test in which the CAISO can pass? 
unless there are other steps, whether it's expanded backstop authority or some other framework, we don't understand how we get from point A to point B. And I think that's really a critical element of this discussion because it really comes down to what I was saying before, which is do we have the commitment from the CAISO and from all the others, all the other EIM entity participants that we see resource efficiency as being critical and that we will pass a common standard. I, I think that's fundamentally the commitment that we need to see. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I agree that all BAA should come to the EDAM resource sufficient. So I, I think we can agree on that. I, again, I'm, I'm really concerned that you're starting to point this in a direction that maybe the EDAM RSC takes all of the, the contracting that happens in the bilateral timeframe and moves that out of the bilateral timeframe and uh, assumes that all entities enter to the EDAM uh, absent the ability to bilaterally contract, like it's, I, I think this principle is important. And I think one of the reasons that we're restarting this is because there was alignment on this principle and it's just that this design shouldn't usurp uh, either the KISO RA program or any of the IRPs that other BAAs are operating under. I, 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 just to clarify, I agree with what you're saying. It doesn't usurp the forward planning, but we're kind, you're kind of saying two fundamentally different things. If, if we're agreeing that the test has to be applied consistently to all participants and that we all need to pass, but you're also saying that if the RA fleet doesn't get you there, you won't take any further action, those things seem fundamentally inconsistent. And like I said before, other BAs are doing exactly this today. If they have a resource insufficiency that they're grappling with, they will go into the bilateral markets and contract until they can meet the test requirements. And I think that exact same approach would be applicable to the CAISO BA. So I'm not suggesting that those other bilateral markets would be unavailable. And in fact, I think they're, you know, forward contracting is critical, but I just don't see how fundamentally we can say that we're just going to stick with our RA fleet or our forward planning procurement, but also say that we're going to all meet a common standard on a day ahead basis. There's a missing link there. Hey, Jeff, Danny, Mark here. D will this level of detail naturally get worked out when we define that requirement, you know, to the extent we get common consensus on what that looks like and then dive into, you know, the resource and supply counting rules and qualification? Because if it does, you know, I, I think this is a good conversation and I agree we need to have it, but, you know, looking at the time and I know we're gonna start getting into, you have a slide, Jeff, on resource qualification and counting. I know the rest of the meeting I'm gonna spend on resource qualification and counting. You know, maybe we pick this conversation back up then. Is that okay with you guys? Mark, Mark, we can pick up this conversation, but, you know, there may be others that, that want to chime in, but I would say that this is a fundamental issue. I mean, this is just a question of what are we trying to achieve and do we have agreement that we will all meet a common standard day ahead or not? And so we can talk about the details, but it doesn't seem like it's that meaningful unless we get past this fundamental core issue. Um, so, you know, happy to kind of move on, but I do think that this is something that needs to get sorted out. Yeah, no, and I, I made a note of it, um, so I, I appreciate that, Jeff. So let me go to Steve Kearns first, and then I'll have you move on, Jeff. Yeah, the, the, this is exactly the thread that I wanted to chime in on. I, I fear, Jeff, that if you set expectations that all market participants should pass RS 100% of the time, you're not going to be satisfied, no matter if it's EDAM or SPP Markets Plus or whatever it is. There are going to be tail events, uh, whether they're August 2020 tail events in CAISO or June 2021 events in the Northwest. And there are going to be times when people are going to find themselves short going into the day. So I, I think it, that's a realistic expectation that you have to plan for. And to say it's a core issue to expect otherwise, I, I think it's setting this up for failure. Um, that's why I agree with where Danny was going. That's why the consequences for failure 
are is probably the better place to have this conversation to make sure that there is correct incentive for for participants to solve any problems that they have to the extent that they can in advance of the day ahead. So I wanted to chime in on that. Um, I also want to chime in on one other piece um, um, of the day ahead resource efficiency test that's different than the EIM resource efficiency test, and that is the, the amount of energy that's required um, um, to pass a, a, a resource efficiency test for the entire day. That, that's something that I think is going to require a little bit of additional thought. I don't think there's any new principles that we need to come up with, but it is a difference from the EIM resource efficiency test that just has to solve it for one hour as opposed to 24 hours. Thank you, Steve. And Jeff, maybe before you respond to that, I would also like to see if I can get you know some of the Desert Southwest or others to, to chime in on this as well. Go ahead, Jeff. Sure. Uh, just to respond to that, Steve, you know, I recognize that there will be instances where an entity may fail the test and we have to have uh, appropriate failure consequences. And I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. And I, I think if that's the way, you know, what I'm saying is coming across, I, I'll, I'll try to phrase that better. Um, I think there's a different issue. It's not about somebody you know, it's, it's a tail event and someone fails, they were trying to pass and they didn't. That's a different issue. The issue I am talking about is the fundamental question of whether every BA, including the CAISO, has defined an approach so that they can take the steps they need to between their longer term planning and getting to the day ahead resource efficient. It doesn't mean it's gonna work 100% of the time, but if we don't agree that the CAISO BA, as well, in the same way that other entities have the ability to go out and supplement and complement their forward planning with contracting and, and uh, arranging for supply when they need to, then I think we have a more significant problem. And that was the point I'm trying to get across. But the other thing I just want to say is, you know, this recent discussion on this, I am um, providing PowerX's perspective. We, you know, we're not talking about something on the slide. So I just wanted to reiterate what I said towards the beginning. Um, I, I think, you know, this is a really important issue, but I am speaking on PowerX's behalf at this point. No, I, I appreciate that clarification, Jeff. And um, can I get someone who, you know, some of the entities that help form the principles to raise their hand and opine on this topic, please? Bobby, I don't know if you're, Bobby Olson from SRP, I don't know if you're on. There he goes. Operator, if you don't mind unmuting Bobby's line, I'd appreciate it. All right, thanks, sorry. Um, was trying to cover a couple of things here at the same point in time, so I apologize. Wasn't tracking the entire conversation. I think as I step back, most of what we've discussed internally within uh, a small group and kind of the continued principles here is is not necessarily inconsistent with what Jeff is putting forward. I mean, when we look at the concept of um, resource efficiency and kind of using that as a demonstration test to ensure that we are, uh, that everyone is bringing adequate supply to the market, um, I think that was the key component. Now, where we didn't necessarily get to is I think where Danny was going, which was, do we get into more consequences of failure? Uh, kind of how do we make sure that this isn't uh, entities coming to the table and leaning or kind of looking for the market to solve based on the flexibility that's there. And I think um, there's a way that we're going to be able to get through this. I know we worked through some of the key principles associated with resource efficiency from a reliability test as part of um, that obligation. I know I facilitated some of that discussion in terms of uh, discussions over the summer and um, I would be happy to bring that conversation back in not too distant future because I think it would be helpful for others to kind of walk through the same types of components to understand as you start working through this, what ultimately happens and how do we, what are the actual issues we need to start thinking about in terms of consequences of failure and, and some of the requirements that play through from a resource efficiency obligation. Hopefully that's responsive, Mark. No, I, I appreciate that, Bobby. Jeff, did you want to, did you have a reaction to that? Or if not, I could move on to some of the other 
you know, maybe I can hear from Kathy Anderson, see if she would like to opine on this as well. Yeah, no, I, I think it would be good to, to continue to hear from others. Thanks. All right. So Kathy, if you're on, I, I did not look to the attendee list, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand or any other individual that was part of that core team. Looking through the attendee list here. Don't mean to put you on the spot. Let's take a look. I do not see Kathy on. Let's see if Scott is on from SCE. Scott, Scott Renzel, do you mind raising your hand and opining on this topic? All right, while we wait for some of the other parties to, to raise their hand, let's go to Dan Williams. Hey, thanks, uh, Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. Just kind of a, a question over to Jeff to maybe clarify a little bit, and this might require Danny to weigh in as well. But, um, you know, that's a reminder back to looking at slides from mid-2020, kind of reminds that we were talking about a diversity credit back at that time. Um, and unless I heard wrong from George the other day, it seems as though that's no longer part of the, the general setup or else maybe we're uh, having some semantics issues here, but in my mind, it seems like, and this is what I'm, I'm wondering how you'd comment on, Jeff, that it, it seems like the uh, the size of the diversity credit in a day ahead sense and whether that gets applied um, prior to the IFM or gets applied somehow in RUC as well, that that has a large bearing on the, uh, the resource efficiency program with regard to reliability that, you know, kind of the more that you're reducing requirements on the expectation that everyone passes and everyone participates fully, then uh, that seems to lead more towards the principle that you've been articulating. But if everyone is truly being assessed individually, um, then maybe if they don't pass, they are sort of dealing with their own consequences more or that gets into a failure consequences issue. But just kind of curious if, one, if there could be a clarification around kind of if the concept of a diversity credit, uh, you know, directly applied to the resource efficiency target is still being considered, and then if so, kind of what that, you know, leads to for your thoughts on it, Jeff. Thanks, Dan. I mean, uh, my assumption had been that we would be incorporating a diversity credit into the design uh, because it is one of the ways to achieve benefits through uh, an EDAM. Uh, so you know, it seems logical to me that we would want to do that um, and try to make sure though that we've done that in a calculated way so that we're comfortable that the amount of that credit is truly reflecting the diversity that's available. So I think, you know, to your to your point of if, you know, if it's the diversity benefit is too ambitious, then then it, it may ultimately start to create a concern around whether or not, you know, the remaining requirement is sufficient or not um, from a reliability point of view. So I think, you know, doing that calculation correctly is important. Um, you know, I don't see the diversity benefit versus not as playing a role in the the leaning issue um, because, you know, fundamentally, I think the issue with leaning is that, you know, if some entities are don't meet the RS requirement, they end up being able to use the supply and the other BAs to fill that shortfall. And I think that that would occur independent from the size of a, of a diversity benefit or whether you've incorporated that. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, I think the, these, the ability to, to access diversity is important and one of the reasons for resource efficiency, but also just for, as we mentioned before, being confident in the market results so that when you do get the market solution, you have um, comfort that 
it's something you can count on. And so if if you're seeing an opportunity to decommit your resources, you can do that and, and be comfortable with it because you know that the, the resources in the other BAs that are um, supplying the energy to you are, are are going to show up when they when they uh, when they need to. So I think these things are somewhat related. Thank you, Jeff. I think uh, that's good. Maybe Mark uh, just you know being able to to bookmark this for discussion in future areas um, you know, because yep. the the diversity credit in the EIM right now for some BAs it's 500 megawatts for others it's it's 50 and if that grows by 10x in EDAM that's a you know, huge difference in a in a sufficiency requirement um, you know, that could be material to the reliability but uh, did you have a comment on just on whether the whether that was even being considered as part of the program at this point so that's I was actually going to thank you for that transition Dan I was I was going to ask Danny Danny Johnson from the ISO to weigh in on the diversity benefit and and I believe he has a few more thoughts and then I'll ask Jeff to move on but I I wrote down everyone in the queue and I will get to you as we move through these slides so thank you everyone for your patience Danny Thanks Mark so I agree with the second part of what Jeff said regarding the results of the EDAM need to be reliable and we need everybody to have confidence in the transfers that are coming out of the EDAM because BAs are not going to be committing units based on the assumption of those transfers being reliable. On the diversity credit, I at least think that is still an open question. I, I know Jeff mentioned that it's not leaning, but I, I think there's a valid argument that if a BAA cannot meet their own obligations and potential uncertainty, that is inherent to their supply and load, then uh, being able to participate in the EIM or the EDM could be leaning. So I, I think that's something that we should give additional consideration to because I don't think that's a that's a resolved issue. And, and I know we're going to be covering what the requirement looks like in coming slides and in coming weeks. So I'll definitely add you know this diversity benefit component to that for a conversation later on. Um, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind moving to, Thank you to that slide, and we'll go from there. Sure. Okay, so now we're getting this element of the presentation is a little bit m more focused on potential mechanics, um, a little bit different than George's approach. Uh, so here's an example of one way of thinking about the potential day ahead timelines, and you know, one thought would be that the test, the binding test is performed at 9 a.m., which is an hour before the bid deadline. And that would assume that then you have a cure period for up to an hour to address any issues. If you fail the, the 9 a.m. test, you, you can make changes. And so, you know, when I said binding at 9 a.m., that's probably not quite the right word, but maybe put another way, the requirements are defined and fixed at that time. You can submit your RS related information and receive a result. And if there is a problem, you can make additional changes for the following hour so that you've got enough time to make adjustments as required. And, you know, this is certainly just one idea. I'm sure there are different timelines that would potentially work, but some of the considerations around when the timeline should be applied and when the test should be applied, I should say, is thinking about the existing day ahead trading and scheduling timelines, um, considering the, the ultimate connection to transmission requirements for EDAM and what comes out of those discussions, um, the ability to validate the supply that's being put into a test. So for example, if you have uh, external resources and you are using uh, those resources to meet your RS requirements, then thinking about the day ahead tagging timelines is important. And then the last one I think is, is another really important one, which is the ability for EDAM participants to have the appropriate tools and advanced information. And that's you know, sort of getting back to some of the discussions from last week around, uh, you know, how, do you need multiple validations or multiple um, 
chances to to validate the results, and I think that goes along with deciding when the requirements are locked down so that there is an understanding of when your final requirements, including a fixed load forecast, fixed uncertainty requirement, et cetera, when is that determined? So those are all considerations. One of the concepts that uh, the EIM entities had thought about was this idea of a 24-hour non-binding plan, operating plan. And there were a number of considerations to why this was a starting point that we had discussed at the time. But really it, it came down to thinking about resource efficiency in four potential categories. So one being energy, which is linked to some of the discussions we've had about say fuel limitations, whether it's gas constraints or hydro uh, uh, fuel limited resources, et cetera. And so you know, how do you kind of convey energy uh, in the context of resource efficiency, or, or even do you even need to, is one question. Another one is the capacity um, to meet up and down requirements. Uh, three, flexibility, and flexibility would be within a single hour, as well as across multiple hours of the day, potentially. And then the last one, transmission, uh, in terms of deliverability of external resources, but also you know, are there potentially constrained zones within a BA? And I think this, again, is another topic we touched on around, you know, I think not wanting to sit, say, uh, go to one bookend of we're, we're running an optimization and fully dispatching the market. And then the other bookend is there's no transmission validation whatsoever. And so the question is, you know, where do you find the, the right balance to try to have an accurate outcome uh, associated with the test, but maintain this. Oh, do you mind going going back one slide? I, I did want to have a natural pause here because I think this aligns with kind of what George put out in one of our previous calls. Um, but something I wanted to note. So I, I heard from you know last week's call, there was an option for the RFE test to only look at the peak hours of the day versus all 24 hours, um, and, and it being an hourly test. So I'm curious to see where, again, the Southwest, Northwest, and California entities land on this. Does it make sense to have that 24-hour test where each hour is being looked at, or the option we heard last week around just the peak hours? So I wanted to pause there, Jeff, if that's okay. And I see Paul Wood raise his hand, so let's go to Paul. Yeah. Oh, Paul, we could barely hear you. You're you're going to want to speak up. Sorry about that. Um, is that any better? Yes. So, anyways, Paul Wood with Pacific Core. While I'm new to the EDM, Pacific Core has been involved, you know, kind of from the get go. A lot of folks have referred to the, to me, the black the company. Oh. But at any rate, I'm trying to you process. What's being said, and I guess my first take is, is that I would think that it relates to energy. You know, meeting your energy requirements of every hour is important, rather than just the peak. Hour. So I would agree with what Jeff. Said. So Paul, it's I'm sorry, I don't know if it's just my line. Um, I I did hear you say you agree with Jeff on. The, the way it was outlined here. So I will take that assumption as you believe that a, a 24 hour test makes more sense. Um, it was a little to hear you. So to the extent I missed anything or mischaracterized that, if you wouldn't mind speaking back up, I'd appreciate it. I don't wanna miss, misstate Pacific Court's stance. Okay. All right. Do I have any other entities from this? Oh, I see Bobby in the queue. Thank you, Bobby. Adam, if you wouldn't mind unmuting Bobby's line. Bobby Olson. I'm here, sorry, uh, double muted. <laughs> um, when it comes to a 24 hour test, I, I think as we've debated it internally here within SRP, I think we believe that a 24 hour test is necessary. You know, if we are just using the peak load, I think there's an opportunity that 
we miss some of the, the net peak requirements that pop up. And I think when we look at kind of the resource future we're looking at, I think understanding um, energy capacity flexibility across every hour um, transmission as well, um, that's going to be critical for every hour. We recognize that that means that there'll be a little bit more optimization for people across different hours, um, but, but that's a pretty critical task for us, 24 hours. Thank you, Bobby. I appreciate that. And then lastly, I'm going to put Justin Thompson on the spot from APS. I apologize, Justin. Adam, if you wouldn't mind, I'm muting Justin's line to see if he wanted to weigh in for APS. Hello, this is Justin Thompson. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, it sounds like you're a little bit away from the phone. So you, if you don't mind speaking directly into it, we'd appreciate it. I've got a headset on. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I, I can hear you. Go for it. Okay. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, uh, back to the questions before. Uh, APS, at APS, we think uh, it's important that entities are resource efficient entering the day. So that's a, just an important concept. Uh, on the test itself, I think it needs to be simple and straightforward. EIM tests we do today are very, very data intensive. And uh, because of that, uh, we also, we often get a lot of uh, false failures uh, just because of either data latency issues or data quality problems. So uh, anyway, as we think about what we create here, our recommendation is to, hey, let's keep it simple and make sure it's, uh, easy to uh, implement and, uh, and the information is transparent. On the diversity credit issue, uh, I think it's uh, a good idea to provide for some form of diversity credit as long as the market is sufficient. So if the overall market is sufficient, then uh, uh, it probably makes sense to uh, help out a VA that you know may be in trouble um, given day from time to time. And maybe what we do uh, in that situation, it, it, instead of cutting them off, maybe there's some kind of uh, financial penalty that uh, we talk about uh, as a failure consequence. Again, it's, you know, all discussion. Um, the other thing I noted here, uh, agree with uh, Jeff and others, that the process should not interfere with state RA or IRP, IRP programs. Uh, yeah, that's uh, essentially none of our business here at EDAM. We should stay away from that. However, uh, liability is key, and so we need to make sure that uh, uh, everyone comes to the table uh, resource efficient. Uh, what else? Thank you, Justin. <clears throat> I appreciate your comments. Let me turn to Danny Johnson at the ISO, and then Jeff, I'll turn it back to you to, to keep us going. Danny, you may be on mute. Thanks, Mark. So a couple things I heard you say. Uh, the first was the RSC not, not usurping that authority for uh, IRP and RA programs and, and I think we still agree with that, and I just wanted to make one more point on that note, is that this is still a voluntary market. So uh, I, I'm at least asking that people kind of keep the fact that EDM is, is a voluntary market in their perspective as we eventually move into the discussion on failure consequences. The other thing that I heard you say, which I think is really important, is the simplicity. But really, I view this as more as simplicity versus accuracy. I think as you're going to see in Jeff's slides and then as as we're going through the counting rules for the RSC, that this is a direct trade-off. I, I think that we would all like the EIM RSC to be simpler and easier to engage with, but part of the reason it's as complicated is because uh, the participants as a whole wanted a very accurate test. So as we develop the counting rules for different resources, uh, I just ask everybody to keep that simplicity versus accuracy in mind and, and realize that the more the more granular and accurate the counting methodologies are, the less simple and more difficult to engage with this test will be. 
right. Thank you, Danny. Jeff, you want to take it back over? Sure. Um, and I think, you know, that's a, Danny's comment there is, is I, I agree with the, the last statement he was making there, that there's probably a trade-off there between simplicity and accuracy and, uh, well, there's going to be multiple trade-offs, but, but, you know, trying to find the right balance where we feel good about the accuracy, but we still uh, believe it to be simple enough that you can interact with the test, you know what your requirements are, you can plan to meet those requirements. Those are really important elements of the design as well. Um, I'm going to move through this pretty quickly. I don't think this is fundamentally much different than George's uh, approach for capacity, um, other than this doesn't have formulas necessarily, but just at a high level, um, if you look at number one, the first question with the number one beside it, do resources have sufficient capacity to meet their load and reserve obligations? And so essentially you would be evaluating whether or not you had enough capacity in a particular hour to meet the, the net load forecast, uh, as well as any uncertainty and your operating reserve requirements. Uh, where I think the thinking that we had at the time differs a little bit from George's approach was we were contemplating this idea of non-binding energy schedules. And it's, I think it'll become more clear on a future slide, but essentially what we were thinking about was a 24-hour plan where you have your resources and they are laid out by their capacities, but then you could basically enter in an energy plan. So it's kind of a theoretical schedule. It's not binding in any way. It's not rep reflecting the market dispatch, but it would just be a way to show how you would use your portfolio to balance your system from hour to hour. And one of the reasons I think we were going down that road was you could visualize it in a spreadsheet. And in fact, it's probably something that most BAs, kind of BA operators would typically be doing today where you would look at a spreadsheet, you might have the 24 hours across the top, you'd have your resources and you'd start figuring out how you would deploy them over the course of the day to meet all the different constraints. And so it seemed as though that kind of basic concept would be one way to start with, uh, to, to define a resource sufficiency test that is being applied on a 24 hour basis rather than hour by hour. Uh, next slide, please. And so that's kind of what this slide was trying to show, which is you, the black line, you have your hourly net load forecast across the hours. So you can see that black line is that is the net load forecast. Then you have some band of uncertainty around that net load. So you can see there is that shaded blue area, both above and below the net load forecast, and that's generally representing the uncertainty. And then the, the gray shaded area represents your contingency reserve obligations, which you need to have resources for, but are probably more of just a, a nomination. They're not part of the optimization necessarily, but one way or the, and maybe they are, but one way or the other, you're just accounting for your uh, contingency reserve obligation through the test. And so what, what it would amount to, if you look at the bottom, is you might have, say, you've purchased um, firm energy, uh, 25 megawatts for the whole day. So that's one of the supply elements in your plan. Then you have a couple of resources, resource A and B, and you shape those resources across the day to show how you would meet your hour to hour load. And one of the benefits of that is it, it helps to address how do you measure flexibility? Because if you think about what that's doing is when you're putting together that plan, if you look at the red box at the bottom, it's requiring that you sort of show how are you deploying resource A and B across, in this example, our 16 to 20, how are you ramping those resources to be able to meet that net load ramp? So then, so the structure of this approach naturally uh, 
um, deals with hour to hour flexibility because you're having to put in these these schedules. And then from there, you would have requirements around ensuring that you've submitted enough flexible bid range up and down so that you could cover that range of uncertainty. So this is pretty different than what George had presented before, but again, we at the time were thinking that a 24 hour plan was something that was easy to understand and that someone that was generally used to you know setting up a, a BA and trying to figure out how to meet their load would likely already be doing something similar to this anyway. And so it would make some sense to try to do something that's intuitive. Next slide, please. Um, so again, you know, I think I just said all these, you know, just trying to keep it simple, but trying to also balance that with being effective. Saying, you know, show how your portfolio is feasible. How do you deploy your resources? Pretty similar to what we might do today. And if it was this simple, I think it would be one way that you could have an interface that entities could submit a plan, see their resource efficiency status, and have those results. And you wouldn't need to worry about a whole bunch of uh, official timelines, say, for advisory tests, because the, the, the structure of the test would allow you to just kind of submit your plan and validate it at any point. Next slide, please. Changing topics slightly, but one of the, some EIM entities more than others, but one of the um, thing, one of the priorities I, I would say was to the extent that it's possible or practical, not holding entities that have passed the day ahead test to another real time test. And with the thinking being that if you have appropriately planned for uncertainty in a day ahead timeframe, then you should have already covered the majority of situations that might occur in real time. And so, you know, it could be that a, a more straightforward, simplified resource efficiency test would be necessary in real time, particularly just to validate that the entity hasn't changed their portfolio in a way that um, undermines the initial result that they received day ahead. But trying to find a way not to hold entities to a new standard real time once they've met the day ahead requirement to the extent that that's practical. Next slide. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there, Mark, and see if there's more discussion. Yeah, so for, if we don't mind, for the EIM real time test, um, Jeff, that's actually one of the scope topic items that we are going to dive into here in the, the coming weeks, so I'd like to hold off. I think if we can get to slide 18, let's pause on slide 18, because I think that's where some of the little bit more detailed conversation is going to naturally happen, and then we'll go from there. Sure. So this is a little bit detailed, but uh, I'll just run through generally the left column, uh, which is pretty consistent with the graphic from a couple of slides ago. but just trying to lay out what elements might be included in the capacity test. And uh, I think having the net load forecast or you know, another way to say that is you've got a load forecast and a VAR forecast. Uh, but either way, you're, you're accounting for your forecast of load and VARs. That's uh, quite obviously an element. Um, contingency reserves. I think the assumption that we had made was that most entities would uh, have their contingency reserve obligations defined in the same way that they are today, and that might include participating in existing reserve sharing groups. We didn't get into much discussion around whether contingency reserves could be optimized. But in terms of verifying sufficiency, I think the assumption is that you would include those in the requirement um, as one element of what needs what you need to have resources to be able to meet. And then uh, the third category is the upward and downward uncertainty and how that is calculated. I think the most obvious inputs of uncertainty are 
load forecast error and variable resource forecast error. Um, but there could be other elements too, you know, curtailments to interchange or resource non-performance. I think those are other elements that could be considered. Um, but certainly the one, the one area that would need to get improved relative to today is to ensure that those calculations are reflective of the actual system conditions that are being forecast. So, you know, as opposed to, to some of the challenges with the EIM approach and the histogram approach, you would have a better mechanism to forecast uncertainty. And then the last one is one that uh, is a new opportunity, which is looking at something called a replacement reserve. Or, and, and the thinking there is whether there would be another reserve type that's probably more of an informal reserve type, uh, which is, you know, entities today when they're planning their system have to think about what happens if they have a real-time forced outage. And contingency reserves can be used to um, address the first 60 minutes of a real-time outage, but then after that 60 minutes, it's up to the BA to figure out how to replace that outage. And so the question is, or the opportunity is, could you also try to pool a new, or a new reserve type, this concept of a replacement reserve where um, the whole footprint would plan for um, a, 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 some amount of additional capacity through the test and through the optimization that, that then would be available to be called upon for periods after that 60 minute contingency reserve window. Uh, so that was that was something for discussion. So uh, anyhow, I'll stop there, Mark, and turn it back to you. No, I appreciate you going through the, the different components here for the RS capacity requirement. Um, so the, I noticed two things when reviewing this slide that I really wanted to, to get the entities to, to weigh in on. Um, so the net hourly demand. You know, here it states that entities would be providing their own forecast, but in previous week's discussion, I heard that the ISO would be providing that forecast and then providing an option, you know, going back to Stuart Kelly's comment, you know, giving the option for the EIM entity to be able to provide their own. So is that the direction everyone agrees with? You know, is it the ISO coming up with this forecast and then to the extent the EIM entity would like to take that on themselves, that option is there for them. And then the second question, you know, the original thought was to have the RSC requirement be based on net hourly demand, reserves, and uncertainty. You know, I really want to ask the audience, is, is that in line with their thinking as well to see if we can come with some common consensus on this capacity requirement? So first, let me go to Kevin Smith at Bank. Hong, I see you in the queue. I will come to you next. So, Adam, if you wouldn't mind unmuting Kevin Smith, I would appreciate it. Kevin, don't forget to oh, there you go. Sorry, I'm having technology issues today. Kevin Smith with Bank. Actually, um, I, I don't really. I have a, a opinion on on the first. Um, I think that you know, from Bank's perspective, I, I mean, we want the best forecast, and so I think having the optionality is fine. Um, but you know, it may very well turn out that it's best that the entity itself uh, has the forecast. So. Um, you know, again, what, what we're looking at is trying to get the best forecast, not, you know, necessarily either or. And in some instances, it may be one or it may be the other. I know in EIM at the early inception, there was, you know, a, a, a problem with the ISO's forecast under for certain entities related to wind and other things. And so there was kind of a convergence between you know, the entity's internal forecasts and the KISO, and they reached, you know, something that actually worked. And so um, I don't think it's just an either or proposition. What I wanted to, um, and I and I will also just going back would say that, 
a bank is just supportive of this hourly and not just a peak type um, uh, uh, process. So, you know, providing hourly forecasts just because of, um, you know, significant hydro and other things within the bank footprint, it just makes more sense that way. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate your comment. Um, Adam, let's, let's unmute Tong. And Tong, if you can chime in on the, you know, the net hourly demand question I had, as well as the requirement itself being net hourly demand reserves and uncertainty. Yeah, uh, for uh, load forecast, uh, I agree with Kevin. I mean, theoretically, I think it would be good for the ISO to provide load forecast because at the end of the day, the ISO would do uh, its operation using ISO's load forecast. Um, but I agree with Kevin that recently we see some uh, negative load forecast. So that so that's so load forecast accuracy needs to be resolved. Um, you know, I, I really want to comment on the uh, uh, uncertainty here. Uh, I really like the graph that Jeff provided earlier, you know, which shows that uh, the RS uh, evaluation is based on the load forecast and net short and is assessed hourly. Um, yeah, that's consistent with what I thought would be a good way to do it. Uh, I also agree with uh, Mark, your early comments that we should separate the RS capacity requirement for the day ahead and RS capacity requirement for the real time. I think these are two different things. Now I see the uncertainty in uh, description column, third row, uh, there are four bullets. Uh, load forecasting error, uh, variable resource forecast error, interchange curtailment, resource non-conformance, uh, performance. I think all these four bullets has to do with the real-time capacity uh, requirements because these uncertainties are disappears at 9 a.m. Uh, uh, according to the graph that Jeff showed earlier, I agree that at 9 a.m. Um, ISO has all the information, uh, the final information to do this assessment, still uh, giving the participants in an hour to make any corrections. At 9 a.m., everything is fixed. I don't think the load forecast will change between 9 and 10. Uh, the transmission is uh, fixed, even if there is any curtailment, be or if, you, if there is any planned outage between 9 and 10, uh, that will not be considered by the IFM, integrated forward market. And so, I don't think these four bullets apply to the day ahead IFM. When you run the IFM, you don't have these uncertainties. But I think the uncertainties that you do have are the ramping simultaneous network visibility and the ramping visibility uh, uh, uncertainties. Those are uh, not really stochastic in nature, but those are things that market participants cannot assess by themselves because they don't have all the information that ISO has to do that assessment. So that would be the uncertainty for the IFM. Once you complete IFM simulation, you have matched the load with your resources, then you consider these four bullets, but that's a different topic yeah. for real time. Okay. Thank you, Tong. Yeah, and I would, I would like to keep that separate. So purposes of the RSC and, and Tong, you, you Forgot to introduce yourself and where you're well, from. You're I from Wapa. For Wapa. I want to make that. For Wapa. Yeah. Yeah. So from from the capacity requirement itself, are you saying it does make sense to to have it be net load forecast plus reserves plus some level of uncertainty, and we won't worry about defining uncertainty right now? Yeah. I I will say the reserves. I, I reserves. If you want people to report reserve, the purpose of those reserve information is used to make sure that there's no double counting of a capacity for a resource because the reserve is, uh, is reserved from the top of the capacity from Tmax as uh, Jeff showed, right? But reserve itself should not be part of the uncertainty. The uncertainty 
you know, to me, the only uncertainty I can think of are simultaneous network feasibility and ramping feasibility. Thank you, Tom. Paul, Paul Wood, I saw your hand coming up and down, um, and then I'm going to go to Danny Johnson at the ISO, see if you wanted to weigh in as well. Um, Adam, if you wouldn't mind unmuting Paul Wood's line, I don't know if he's having issues raising his hand or not. Hey, thanks, Rick. Paul Wood, seven four. I guess my thoughts on the on the uh, Hey, Paul, I'm sorry, it's really hard to hear you. Um, I don't know if your headset's having issues or if it's not appropriately connecting. Yeah, let me take a pause. Please. You there, Paul? You may be muted. I just don't know if I can get it fixed. Is that any better? Okay, I can hear you now, Paul. Okay, I, I, I just want to load forecast. Is I have to understand like what the cost would be if if you know Tal ISO did the forecast whether it's load or not for the phones as well as if EA did it, what would be the penalty for, you know, not meeting some predetermined cost? I think not meeting Danny, did you want to weigh in? I'm, I'm still struggling to hear Paul, and I'm not sure if it's on my side or, or everyone else's. I, I know his question was related to the load forecast, Sure, Mark. Uh, I think I heard a lot of different stuff from uh, Kevin, Ty, and Paul that I can try to comment on. Uh, to Kevin's point, I, I think we would agree that we want the most accurate forecast to be used uh, in the day, the EDM RSC, and then eventually in actually clearing the day ahead market and or the day ahead market's rock. So I think that our or the perspective we're coming at this from is ensuring that the most accurate forecast is used, but also ensuring that there's kind of a consistent or baseline methodology in how those forecasts are derived so that one entity couldn't gain an advantage from having a, an inaccurate forecast that tended to under forecast, for example. So I think I think we have alignment there. Tong, I, I wasn't quite sure where you were going with uncertainty. I think the way we viewed the uncertainty and what Jeff's trying to identify here is the uncertainty that arises between the day ahead and the real time, which the day ahead markets proposals imbalance reserve uh, attempts to address. So our thoughts were that is a, that's really an important component of ensuring the transfers are reliable is that entities bring enough uh, capacity into the EDAM so that we can procure for that uncertainty that occurs between the day ahead and real time to ensure the reliability of transfers and then I wasn't quite sure what Paul was saying either, Mark. Thank you, Danny. And Paul, I apologize. Um, it, it is hard to hear you, so I will chalk that up as technical difficulties. So what I've heard is, you know, a few state that it may make sense to have EI amenities have the option to provide their own forecast. And I haven't heard any pushback on what the capacity requirement would be comprised of. Um, let me go to Stuart and then we'll move on, Jeff, to the next slide. I appreciate everyone's patience. Stuart? Mark, um, I, I think I would benefit, um, when it comes to the four bullets around uncertainty, just to better understand how we're proposing to calculate that before opining on you know, whether they should be included or, or excluded. I'm, I'm more concerned about the actual calculation itself, um, given some issues we've had historically with RIC. Um, when it comes to reserve, um, I, I'm, like Tom, I'm, I'm not so much sure the reserve component should be included. I, I may be missing that part, uh, or maybe that's specific to just, you know, the alignment within the CAISO market. Uh, the case of BA when it comes to their reserve and um, some some issues um, that, that we may have. So I'm not I'm not clear on 
why we're thinking the reserve should be included as, as part of the uncertainty. I may have missed that dialogue. Yeah. And then, uh, just lastly, on the um, providing the forecast, I, I think there needs to be some measure, at least, or, or to uh, comparing the day ahead to the actual, irrespective of who provides it, and making sure that, you know, as it pertains to an uncertainty component, there isn't the um, ability to, you know, potentially lean by providing an erroneous forecast. Uh, and, and not having it covered through uncertainty. Okay, so you're looking for some type of accuracy threshold potentially. So I think for the reserve component, you know, given, you know, the RSC, you know, again, we're looking for EDAM entities to be reliable heading into day ahead. Um, Danny Johnson from the ISO, did you want to weigh in on Stuart's reserve comment? Yeah, I think this gets back to, Stuart, what you highlighted, and I think what Tom was highlighting. There, there is an advantage to making sure that each entity brings reserves sufficient to meet their own reserve obligations and ensuring there isn't double counting. I think there's a number of ways which these reserves could be shown. They could just be self-provisioned, and, and there could be a bid range on units that can't be optimized that would be held back for reserves. I think there's the potential for the EDAM to provide uh, intra BAA uh, optimization, uh, given a preset target for reserves even. Our idea is simply to ensure the eventual reliability of these transfers that each entity should have uh, the necessary reserves going into the EDAM. Okay, got you. Yeah, yeah, I'll await, uh, you know, further, further details and, and those ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. All right, Jeff, I'm gonna turn it back to you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, you know, I just add, uh, I think what I agree with the way Danny was characterizing that. I mean, just as a kind of simple numerical example with respect to contingency reserves, if just if, for example, the, the load, let's say the load in BC is 7,000 megawatts for an hour, we might have a 500 megawatt contingency reserve obligation. And so the assumption is that if we're resource sufficient, we would need 7,500 megawatts of resources to be able to meet the load and meet the, the contingency reserve obligation. Uh, so that was really all we were trying to convey was that somehow accounting for the fact that you have that 500 megawatt obligation in the test. And like Danny said, you know, whether it's a, on the requirement side of the ledger or if it's more that you, uh, designate resources and reduce the supply that's otherwise available for load, I think you could achieve that both ways theoretically. And uh, the other thing I'll just add is from an uncertainty point of view, I think um, it is what we were discussing was the uncertainty between day ahead and real time. And uh, I think that actually kind of goes to this slide pretty well. So, you know, this is just thinking about flexibility, but it also touches on uncertainty because as I mentioned before, if you're planning a 24 hour, uh, creating a 24 hour resource plan and you're entering in how you would schedule your resources, at least theoretically, to meet your hour to hour load, in doing that, you're, you're naturally covering your hour to hour flexibility requirements because you're showing how you would actually deploy resources over say a three or four hour period, what have you. So you're you're capturing that need or that requirement for multiple hours of flexibility just by the design of a 24 hour plan. And then the remaining flexibility requirements would stem largely from the uncertainty. And like I just mentioned, we were thinking of that uncertainty as the, the day ahead to real time uncertainty so that when you perform the day ahead test, you are validating that there's enough supply under a range of real time conditions. So if your real time load comes in high or your variable resources come in low, you've got supply to balance those forecast errors in real time. Uh, but, but the other element of that approach was uh, 
we had assumed at the time that there would be a day ahead imbalance reserve product similar to the CAISO's day ahead market enhancements initiative and the products being proposed there. And so what that would allow for is each BA has a resource sufficiency requirement and that requirement includes an uncertainty component. But then when the market is dispatched, those uncertainty requirements become market awards for imbalance reserve. And so you could have a, an efficient dispatch of resources, including resources in other BAs, be receive market awards to, to carry the reserve needed to cover uncertainty in a different BA. So we all enter with sufficient supply as part of that resource efficiency metric, but then the optimization takes all those requirements and redistributes them according to the efficient dispatch. And now you may find that your resources in your BA weren't the ones that received the uh, dispatch for imbalance reserve. It was some other resource in another BA because they were more cost effective. And at that point, you then your resources essentially freed up from having to cover your own uncertainty because it's being covered in a more efficient way from another uh, BA instead. So there was a connection we saw between accounting for uncertainty in the test and making sure the test is robust, but then also enabling a, a re-optimization uh, of how that uncertainty is then carried through the market solution into real time. Um, the only other element that we thought was worth raising at the time was, which is a little bit different for, probably from the imbalance reserve product as it's currently being considered, but is just recognizing that some amount of uncertainty that you may be anticipating day ahead will become more clear or will materialize in advance. And wh what I mean by materialize is just that, let's say you, you have 500 megawatts of uncertainty on a day ahead basis in your load. You might find that by the time you get into the operating day in real time, by nine or 10 in the morning, you can now recognize that your load's coming in high you're not likely to be surprised at the last minute that 500 megawatts of load just appeared in the peak hour. It's probably gonna be something that's gonna start trending that direction earlier than that. And so that would suggest that it could be that some element of your uncertainty requirement could be met with resources that are slower to, to deploy because you would say, well, you know, maybe X percent of my uncertainty I could carry on a slower ramping resource because I'll, I'll see it coming and I'll have time to, to start ramping that up in advance. I don't need to have, say, 15 minute flexible resources to cover that entire uncertainty between day ahead and real time. So that was just another consideration that we had thought about. Uh, next slide. Jeff, and oh, sorry. maybe before we move on, I, I believe Danny Johnson raised his hand and I'm not sure if it was in reaction to the slide or his previous comment. Danny? Thanks, Mark. No, it, it was in reaction to that slide, Jeff. I, thank you. I think you've really highlighted the important interaction we see between the CAISO's EDAM effort and the Day Ahead Markets Initiative. I think a lot of the, the more nuanced discussion that you have in that slide is the exact uh, policy and design that we're trying to work through in that initiative. So I think this aligns with the thinking that, that or the design that uh, we're pursuing, but for additional details on the Day Ahead Market Initiative, I'd refer all interested stakeholders to that uh, parallel process. I'd also like to note that we plan to go live with the Day Ahead Market uh, design at the same time as EDM to try to, or to allow for this type of uncertainty to be addressed between Day Ahead and real time. So thanks for highlighting this for us. All right, thanks. back to you, Jeff. Um, I think I may have already mentioned this, but another important element in terms of 
accuracy and, and defining the requirements so that they're not too high or too low and, and that we we're confident that they're reflecting system conditions is is to, to find a better solution for calculating uncertainty um, relative to the EIM method. And I know that this is something that is coming up both in the context of the EIM resource sufficiency test and the flexible ramping refinements. But you know, regardless of the forum, I think just the point is we really need to find a way to ensure that if we're accounting for uncertainty of renewable resources, that that's done in a way that's consistent with the expected conditions. So for example, not being forced to carry upward reserves for wind when there's no wind in the forecast, because that's just not something that uh, uh, reflects the reality. If there's no wind to fall off, then there's no need to have upward reserves to cover that. Um, we also touched on before that an accurate resource efficiency test probably needs to look at what are the uncertainties that might uh, arise after the day ahead solution. Load bears are pretty clear. Forced unit outages is one that could be uh, considered, especially if a replacement reserve type product or requirement was considered. Um, but also, you know, making sure that the interactions between those different uh, uncertainties are properly considered. And that's just really reflecting the idea that you might have a, a probability of your load coming in higher than expected. You might have a probability of your VARES coming in low. You might have another probability that you lose an outage. Um, but you, you can't just add up each of those independently. Your requirement will be too high. You have to find a way to recognize that the chances that all of those things occur at the same time is, is more unlikely. And so just thinking through what calculations are necessary to get that uncertainty right is something that's important. And uh, once it's done, I think another really important element is having a defined process to continuously assess whether it's working or not. I think this is an area where, you know, with the EIM test, there's been concerns about that calculation for quite some time, and it's been challenging to, to, to get a solution in place. So I think in this context, we would have to have some kind of predefined mechanism to continuously evaluate whether these calculations are appropriate or not. So, Mark, I'll stop there and see, do we want to take more questions or comments? Let's, so we're at 2.46, Jeff. I'm going to give you another four or five minutes. So maybe we get into qualifying supply. I think that will be a natural stopping point for today's discussion, given that, you know, the slide deck that I had prepared for today was getting into some of the qualifications for supply, and then we could pick up Friday morning's meeting uh, on just that topic and start focusing on those details. So I will let you continue on slide 22, pause there, ask a few questions, and then maybe turn it over to, to Bob to kind of recap today's discussion, and then we'll close out. Okay. The discussion around qualifying supply in the next few slides was separated between internal resources and external resources from the perspective of a given BA. And uh, so looking at internal resources, the, the concept was internal resources need to be capable of performing when they're dispatched and that whatever quantity that is being used to uh, meet RS requirements should be realistic and reflect the, the true operating capability of that resource. And there could be a number of reasons why that value is different than its theoretical maximum and it might be fuel related it might be that there are ambient d rates or outages or other restrictions but just the the concept being that we want to find a way for this to be realistic and not just use the nameplate or 
or what happens to be in the master file, but find a way to accurately reflect resources. And, uh, and then having ongoing metrics that evaluate that to see whether it's working as we intend. Um, with deliverability with, within a VA, um, I think, you know, the ideal situation is that internal resources that are being uh, used to meet RS are deliverable uh, into the major load areas within the VA. We, I don't think we had um, necessarily agreement on this, but we had had a discussion that there could be a need for a more zonal test for some VAs. For example, if there are VAs that have uh, more than one kind of key area with a transmission constraint in the middle, you know, California comes to mind, but there could be others that have similar um, issues along those lines. Would we need to look at this more zonally than just one VA at a time? Uh, but of course, recognizing this is one of those areas of trade-offs between, you know, how complicated do you get, and can you find a way to make it simple but accurate? Uh, and that's really the question on that. Next slide, please. Or, or sorry, Mark, did you want to stop there, or did you want to go through all three? Of let's them? let's do yeah, let's do all three of them real quick, and then I'll I'll kind of help tee up Friday's discussion, and then we'll go from there, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. For external resources, the discussion was they have to be real, they have to be identified and non-recallable. And I know we'll have to have discussions about what does that mean. But as a starting point, we wanted to be sure that you, know, you could know that the resource was there and available. Uh, you could see where it was uh, and, and know that it was a firm resource. And that it was, you'll, you'll see this terminology, highly reliable transmission, uh, the same wording I believe was used in some of the transmission materials. Um, we didn't want to be prescriptive around saying it must be uh, NERC priority seven firm transmission as an example, but we wanted to maintain that principle that the resources that you're counting on should be deliverable and, and you should be able to rely on that transmission. And so that's sort of a fundamental principle without being uh, so prescriptive as to start defining the specific NERC priorities that would achieve that outcome. And one of the areas that uh, we discussed was day ahead e tags as a critical means to be able to confirm that the supply is meeting that criteria. Uh, because if you have an e tag, what it really allows for is you can see on that e tag the the nature of that transaction. It shows you either the resource or the system resource that's being used. It shows you what the source BA of that resource is and what the sync BA is. And it shows you the transmission path and the priority. So it really gives you all of the pieces that you need to avoid double counting and also to evaluate that yes, that supply is real, it's available and, and it's deliverable. Um, and so it, day ahead ETAG seemed like the obvious fit for this given that you know, the majority of transactions across the West use day ahead e-tags, so this seemed like a natural fit. And something that we, we think is really important to make sure that the KISO modeling would have all the necessary information and the resource sufficiency test would be supported by resources that you can count on. Last slide. Uh, this gets into some more details of how do you fit tags and, and some of the issues around timing of tags with doing a test in the morning. I'll just go through this very quickly, but uh, there were a few different categories of transactions that we had thought of. One, bilateral transactions between uh, EDAM entities or EDAM participants, uh, imports that are coming from outside of the footprint, and then uh, intertie bids to the extent there's KISO and or EDAM intertie bids, which is something that has been discussed in some of these workshops. And so we may need to have different requirements that would fit different categories if you're looking for a way to validate these types of transactions in a sufficiency test, you know, how would you do that? And I think um, the first type, firm energy transactions, basically you know, a, a bilateral transaction for energy, probably the most 
straightforward to verify because um, e-tags are submitted by 3 p.m. and it's pretty clear if an e-tag doesn't show up that it wasn't tagged and and something went wrong there. So um, those you know transactions maybe would be validated even if the e-tag wasn't submitted at the time of the day ahead RS test itself you'd know that it was coming by the end of the day and it would give you a means to evaluate that. Um, the other one that's listed as type two is more complicated, which is bids. If you are looking at intertie bids, it's not necessarily clear whether or not that bid has a resource behind it or not. And this is something that has been an issue in the past in the CAISO markets. And so, in those cases, when there's no clear means to, to validate whether or not that bid is supported by a resource, um, in those cases, it might be that the e-tag is submitted up front before the test is performed. And then that gives that verification of if someone just submits a bid that it's actually supported from a specific uh, set of resources in a BA and that you know where the transmission path and, and what, the, what the transmission path is and what the associated transmission reservations are. Um, so that's the end of this section. Uh, I know we probably don't have much time for comments, but uh, I'll stop yeah. there, Mark. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff, and I appreciate you kind of closing it out in the way you did. So, you know, I know we are just starting to kind of get into discussions on what resource characteristics should be considered, if any, um, you know, keeping in mind we're trying to keep the RSC simple, and you know, it's not intended to air quote run a market prior to running a, a market for EDAM. Um, you know, so something I want everyone to think about and come ready to discuss on Friday, you know, is what constraints or limitations, energy limits, what characteristics should we be thinking about to consider so that these resources are accounted fairly, they're not being overly credited or underly credited, counting towards one's um, RFC, you know, should the energy bid itself simply represent these limitations? Um, you know, a few slides back, there was the de deliverability assessment. You know, we talked about the test not taking into account transmission constraints. So let's let's be ready to discuss that. And then lastly, on on external resources, reading through the principles, you know, EDAM was to take into account and not impact others RA or IRP programs. Okay, so the first thing that pops in my mind is, you know, the WFTP Schedule C transactions, you know, how does that fit into the RSC and whether or not those should be accounted for and accredited accordingly? Um, so those are all things that I would like everyone to, to think about and come ready to discuss on Friday. I really want to thank you, Jeff, for your time. I, I hope this proposal and your walkthrough really help level level set and, and spur some of the thinking and conversation for the stakeholders. Um, I know I learned quite a bit, so I appreciate it. For there, I, I wanted to pause and turn it over to Bob Cott to see if he can go quickly go through what we covered today, and then we'll go ahead and adjourn. All right, Mark, can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead, Bob. All right, good, yeah. Um, well, I, I think there was a lot of discussion about uh, the principles uh, and definitions around our uh, resource efficiency. I won't dive into all those details as those are pretty much spelled out on the slides. I just wanna kind of go over some of the key comments and questions that came up. Uh, there was some talk around the leaning in the market and uh, some discussion that resource efficiency is fundamental design element to ensure market will have capacity and energy to meet reliability. And around that topic, uh, there seemed to be kind of an open question about uh, the fact that our resource efficiency should not alter RA programs or state planning of resource adequacy. Um, but there's a concept that additional procurement may be needed to meet RSE, and so there probably will be more discussion on that topic. Um, <clears throat> and then there's also a question about the diversity benefit and how that gets applied. Uh, so there's discussion around that. 
and then uh, some discussion around the 24-hour test versus a peak uh, requirement. There seems to be some consensus that a 24-hour test seems to make the most sense. Um, and then there's uh, some discussion around the uh, concept that uh, we be simplicity, you know, have simplicity, but also we need to have accuracy. So we need to find a balance between those two concepts. Um, and then regarding uh, the forecast, uh, seem to be consensus that the most accurate forecast is preferred. Um, and so it might, and I think entities seem to agree that uh, they need to be, it needs to be an option that entities have ability to use their own forecast, if that might mean that was the most accurate one. And then I, you know, finished off with these uh, requirements discussion, which I think will continue to pray. Okay. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate the recap. Did you have something else to add? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, no, that's it. That's it, Mark. Thanks. All right, perfect. Thank you. And again, thank you again, Jeff, and everyone's participation today. Um, great dialogue, great discussion, and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon, and I look forward to talking to you on Friday.